Hello everyone, Dr. Suresh here and in this video we will be talking about the blood glucose levels and its regulation in the body. Right. So we are all aware blood glucose levels maintained within the range like 70 to 100 milligrams per deciliter and there are different parameters I mean like different conditions where this blood glucose level will vary like conditions like fasting state okay fasting blood glucose level will be 70 to 100 otherwise random blood glucose level 100 to 120 milligrams per deciliter and after post pandemic that means if, if any food you have taken after one or two hours if you check the blood glucose level it will be like 120 to 140 milligrams per deciliter but not beyond that because our body has a sophisticated mechanism which will not allow the blood glucose levels to raise above 140 milligrams per deciliter right so there are two conditions keeping this normal range as a criteria hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia if any blood glucose level is above the normal range like 70 to 100 based on the condition okay so that is hyperglycemia high blood glucose concentration in circulation and the levels which are below the normal range leads the condition hypoglycemia right so generally after the intake of carbohydrate meal blood glucose level raises to 120 to 140 milligrams per deciliter but not beyond that got it so to maintain that means there should be a mechanism which shouldn't allow the blood glucose levels to go beyond the normal range at the same time it should not allow the blood glucose levels to go below the normal range so there we have specific mechanisms and lot of factors which involved in regulation of blood glucose that means blood glucose homeostasis and this has been maintained by so many factors one among such is hormones hormonal regulation is the primary one next is metabolic processes and third one is renal mechanism these are the three key factors which play major role in blood glucose homeostasis so first we will discuss about hormone regulation of blood glucose homeostasis and two hormones mainly okay one is insulin and second one is glucagon so both are the peptidyl hormones that means they are peptide in nature which are secreting from the pancreas at the time of digestion at the time of absorption when there is a high blood glucose levels one hormone such as insulin will uh, excrete uh, from the pancreas at the same time when there is no blood glucose so in that condition glucose uh, glucagon will come into the action and trying to raise the blood glucose level so both these hormones are antagonist in action okay insulin try to bring down blood glucose levels okay when there are excess of blood glucose okay at the same time glucagon which tend to increase the blood glucose levels when the levels of blood glucose are going below the normal range so that's why insulin is known as hypoglycemic hormone and glucagon is known as hyperglycemic hormone you see here in the diagram the reciprocal control that means oppose each other's action so insulin as i told insulin will come to the action when there is increased levels of blood glucose in circulation at the same time if the blood glucose levels are decreased below the normal range glucagon will come into the action you see here when there is high blood glucose level there will be signal to the pancreas to release insulin so insulin will come into the action and promotes more glucose to enter into the cells so once suppose like this is a cell this is a circulation so insulin will come into the action okay it will ask cell to take more glucose that means it increases the cellular uptake of glucose so what happened as the glucose enter inside the blood glucose levels in circulation will tend to come to the normal range so that's why insulin is a hypoglycemic hormone right so when same way there are another condition when there is low blood glucose levels there will be signal to pancreas to release glucagon okay so what it will do it will stop all the catabolic processes and it will start anabolic processes such as gluconeogenesis pathway so from different non carbohydrate sources so that blood glu glucose levels will be produced uh, glucose concentration will be increased and it will try to maintain the normal blood glucose levels so both are important in their way depending on the condition so how like these hormones will be playing major role like based on the condition like well fed state and in fasting state so well fed state in the sense we are taking excess of food and we are well fed and what are the changes these hormones will do to the carbohydrate metabolism that means like uh, blood glucose homeostasis so first well fed state what happens there will be blood glucose levels after digestion transfer absorption and transport 
okay the glucose will be dumped to the liver and liver will transport all the glucose to the circulation to reach different parts of the body so this time all the glucose uh, levels will be uh, higher right so in that condition this condition called hyperglycemia after every meal okay so there will be increased levels of insulin also by seeing there is a sensory mechanism where when the glucose concentration is higher okay pancreas will excrete insulin okay and this insulin will go and promote the cellular uptake of glucose and hence it decreases the blood glucose in the decreases the glucose in the circulation so insulin reduces blood glucose levels in number of ways there are what are the ways that insulin will be decreasing the higher uh, blood glucose concentration so you see here in this diagrammatic picture the diagrammatic presentation first it facilitates the transporter so we have already studied in our previous videos the transporters of glucose right from the intestine to different parts right there are glut 1 glut 2 glut 3 glut 4 glut 5 and glut 7 and then uh, sodium dependent glucose transporter all the transporters are there but out of all these transporters there is one transporter which is under insulin action that is glut 4 okay this glut 4 transporter abundantly present in skeletal muscle so it will go and ask the transporter to open the gate so that the glucose present in circulation will go inside the skeletal muscle cells right so that is the one way it uh, decreasing the blood glucose concentration and it also promotes the pathways like glycolysis glycolysis is breakdown of glucose right so it activates the pathway glycolysis and also protein synthesis so when glycolysis is keep on takes placing the end product will be pyruvate by the means of transamination reactions this pyruvate will be converted into alanine as a non essential amino acid and this alanine will be involved in protein synthesis right the other side excess of a pyruvate will be converted to other way acetyl coa but because of the shortage of the substrates in the tca cycle not all the acetyl coa enter into tca cycle and one of the acetyl coa few of the acetyl coa will be transposed or diverted for the pathway glycogenesis fatty acid synthesis and other way glycogenesis so not all the glucose will be broken down and the glucose will be converted to glucose 6 phosphate to glucose 1 phosphate and with the help of utp it will be converted to udp glucose and with the help of the enzyme glycogen synthase it start the process glycogen formation okay that's why glycogenesis so alternatively insulin is having the negative modulator effect that is like lipolysis because already we are in excess of energy so no need of any substances which gives energy right so we know we don't require any fatty acid degradation okay so insulin will inhibit that process at the same time gluconeogenesis already glucose is there why we need to produce again glucose so that gluconeogenesis pathway is also inhibited by insulin and protein catabolism yes already glucose is there so gluconeogenesis means non carbohydrate sources will be producing glucose so we don't require any of the others uh, biomolecules to be produced or involved in production of glucose okay so protein catabolism also inhibited by insulin and glycogenolysis so one hand it is promoting glycogenesis then what is the use if glycogenolysis is happening so it has got negative effect on glycogenolysis also so overall glycolysis protein synthesis lipogenesis and glyco all synthetic pathways has been activated by insulin and all catabolic pathways has been uh, inhibited by insulin so this is a, a diagrammatic presentation of mechanism of action of insulin various pathways so what about glucagon so glucagon as we said glucagon will come into the action when there are low blood glucose levels so here we are already fed in state i mean well fed so we don't want any pathway that involved in production of glucose right so in that condition glucagon what it will do it glucagon decreases glycogen synthesis in the liver anyhow in well fed state glucagon there is it has got nothing there is no role with this uh, well fed state condition so here it increases glycogen phosphorylase so other hand insulin will be inhibiting glycogen breakdown right and here glucagon it increases hormone sensitive lipase activity that means increase in fatty acid mobilization from adipose tissue this also is not take place in well fed state and phosphopeptokinase when that means decreases glycolysis in the liver okay but here we are in well fed state okay so what is happening uh, glycolysis has to uh, be slow down at the same time increased phosphoenol pyruvate carboxykinase so gluconeogenesis enzyme key enzyme for gluconeogenesis which has to be raised on the activity of glucagon but these are all the enzymes key enzymes like glycogen phosphorylase phosphoenol pyruvate carboxykinase hormone sensitive lipase phosphopeptokinase these are the enzymes their action will be decreased in presence of uh, insulin and these enzymes activity will be increased in case of glucagon so now uh, the other condition that is fasting state 
so we have seen a condition like uh, hyperglycemic condition now the condition is maintenance of blood glucose in fasting stage that is hypoglycemic condition so in hypoglycemic condition what are all the changes will be taking place so here in hypoglycemic condition because we don't have any blood glucose levels that means the blood glucose levels are going below the normal range so in order to keep the maintain uh, keep the normal range what are all the hormones will come to the action the major hormone to be discussed is glucagon epinephrine adrenaline glucocorticoids growth hormone adrenocorticotropic hormone and then thyroxine all these hormones play major role in hypo condition you will come to the action like hypoglycemia tend to raise the blood glucose level that's why these hormones known as hyperglycemic hormones glucagon epinephrine glucocorticoids growth hormone adrenocorticotropic hormone and thyroxine glucagon as i mentioned glucagon insulin both are antagonistic in nature okay glucagon opposes the action of insulin it acts primarily on the liver as follows the main action of glucagon is on the liver okay in the liver it stimulates glycogenolysis and inhibits glycogen synthesis yes we need glucose so whatever the storage form of glycogen is there it has to broken down and to form free glucose right so this pathway has been activated by glucagon at the same time it enhances gluconeogen synthesis of glucose from non carbohydrates such as pyruvate lactate or else like glycerol or else like non essential amino acids like pyruvate alanine aspartic acid glutamate so like this they all form glucose okay and what about the epinephrine so stimulation like what epinephrine will do okay this epinephrine will stimulate glycogenolysis okay and in the liver and in the muscles by stimulating glycogen phosphorylase so epinephrine increases the activity of glycogen phosphorylase both in liver as well as in the muscle so that glycogenolysis will increase and remember in liver this glycogenolysis will form free glucose but not in uh, muscle because there is no enzyme glucose 6 phosphatase so that's why there is no free glucose but the production of glucose 6 phosphate in the skeletal muscle and this glucose 6 phosphate will be involved in glycolysis and produces the energy okay in muscles due to absence of glucose 6 phosphatase glycogenolysis results in the formation of lactate that's what and this lactate has to be transported back to the liver where gluconeogenesis will takes place lactate will be converted to pyruvate and pyruvate to again phosphonyl pyruvate and the reversal of glycolysis finally free glucose and the glucose is the main product leading to increase in the blood glucose glucocorticoids they are also having the hyperglycemic effect okay gluconeogenesis they also increase okay they increase the gluconeogenesis and the activity of enzymes of gluconeogenesis protein catabolism they are supporting the protein catabolism breakdown of proteins and proteins will form amino acids and the amino acids such as alanine aspartic acid glutamate they all involve in conversion of one of the substrate of tcs cycle or in product of uh, glycolysis hepatic uptake of amino acids will be increased they stimulate the hepatic cells to take more of amino acids such as alanine aspartic acid glutamic acid so that they'll be converted they are involved in the process gluconeogenesis and they inhibit the utilization of glucose in extra hepatic tissues okay next hepatic tissues in the sense maybe like intestinal cells you can take like renal cells you take so there they will inhibit the uptake of glucose next growth hormone growth hormone and uh, adrenocorticotropic hormone they antagonize the action of insulin growth hormone decreases glucose uptake in the muscles and acth AC decreases glucose utilization by the tissues so this way they will minimize the utilization of glucose and use that glucose for maintaining or bringing back the normal range of glucose in the circulation so thyroxine accelerates the hepato hepatic glycogenolysis and consequent rise in blood glucose it may also increase the absorption of hexoses from the intestine so two way one is at the intestine level other is at the hepatic level so that means liver so at liver it promotes glycogen breakdown at the intestine it promotes the absorption of hexoses such as glucose from the intestine renal control mechanism glucose is uh, one of the important substrate and it shouldn't be excreted in the urine so though the glucose is uh, passing through the kidney it's not supposed to be excreted in the urine it has to be reabsorbed right but still in conditions like what is happening like if your blood glucose levels is above 180 mg per dl so we are all aware so any water reservoir you take okay any reservoir construction there will be marked as number of feet like 100 feet 200 feet 300 400 up to 1000 feet will be there when the flood is coming when the water flow is up to the mark like 800 feet what will happen up to 800 feet the storage capacity so beyond that what happen if they keep on storing the dam will collapse same way here the so what they will do to minimize to uh, minimize the damage what they will do they will open the gates and they will allow the water to flow down same way here kidney also when circulation is having 180 mg per dl of uh, glucose it will reabsorb but after that level 
kidney will not retain the glucose it will simply allow the glucose to excrete in the urine that is called renal threshold value okay remember renal threshold value of glucose is 180 mg per deciliter and above 180 mg per deciliter if your blood glucose levels are more than this then glucose is absolutely will be seen in the urine okay so it's a condition called glycosuria so glycosuria is the excretion of detectable amount of sugar in the urine is known as glycosuria and glycosuria results if the rise of blood glucose above its renal threshold level as i mentioned 180 mg per deciliter is the limit for the kidney to retain the blood glucose if the concentration of glucose is above 180 mg per deciliter simply it will allow the rest of the glucose to excrete in the urine and leads a condition glycosuria so glycosuria may be uh, like uh, different in nature okay on the basis of which okay they have been classified okay the one is alimentary glycosuria renal glycosuria and diabetic glycosuria and alimentary glycosuria is a type of glycosuria where there will be like if the person is consuming high carbohydrate diet okay in that condition more glucose uptake and leads to sudden increase in the glucose concentration in the uh, blood so leads like uh, glycosuria right and the glucose whatever there in the circulation will start appearing in the urine but here there is another condition like if there is any surgical removal of part of the stomach what happen there will be sudden increase in the blood glucose concentration and there will be kidney will not be able to handle it and the glucose will be appearing in the urine that is a condition so here because of the intestinal issues okay and more uptake of intestine the glucose more uh, more glucose uptake by intestine leads a glycosuria that is alimentary glycosuria and renal glycosuria is the one where if there is damage to the kidney if the nephrons or the filtering or reabsorption mechanism of kidney is not working because of uh, any disease or uh, some damage of uh, kidney structure okay the glucose will not be reabsorbed it will be simply appear in the urine leads a condition renal glycosuria because here glycosuria is because of kidney problem so that's why it is renal glycosuria and diabetic glycosuria here kidney is absolutely fine but the thing is there will be sustained keep on i mean like sustained high blood glucose levels okay which the glucose uh, kidney cannot be handling the high levels of glucose so the glucose start appearing in the urine leads a condition diabetic glycosuria so these are the three types of glycosurias and we'll see the main important thing that is diabetic glycosuria and the condition like diabetic uh, type 1 and type 2 diabetes right so this uh, gestational diabetes is also there in case of pregnancy there also rise in blood glucose levels okay that we will study separately under the topic diabetes mellitus thanks for watching thank you